Life is fragile. It's a fact we're learning in real time, every day. What we once called normal has seemingly disappeared. There's uncertainty in the air, restlessness in our hearts. Things we once took for granted are becoming difficult to find. Our usual day-to-day -day has evolved into this odd chaos. Peace is becoming obsolete. Many have lost jobs, security, and those they love. The pain is undeniable. But what if our fragility caused us to lean harder into God? What if in our weakness, we chose to rely more on His strength? Would our outlook change? Would the peace that passes understanding begin to drown out the noise of this moment? Would we walk in a quiet confidence, knowing our God is mighty to save? We're not promised tomorrow, but we are given a simple truth to stand on. Our God goes before us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Yes, life is fragile. But in our weakness, He is strong. Good morning, St. Andrew's family. We are so glad to have you with us this morning in worship. Um, we hope that you guys are all doing well. We sure miss seeing your faces here. Uh, but I'm glad that we can at least stay connected online. So um, we hope that you will just move everything, push everything aside that might be on your heart or your mind today that might be just weighing you down. Just move that all out of the way and let's focus on our Heavenly Father today.
every painted sky a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you so St. Andrew's family. We are so happy to be worshiping with you today. If you have a friend or family member you'd like to invite to worship with us this morning, just click the invite button in the chat screen and you can invite anyone in your contact list to receive a link to immediately join us in worship. If you have a prayer request, you can share it with us in the chat screen or you can click on the request prayer bubble during worship. And we also want to inv invite you to our night of prayer. It's this coming Wednesday, June 17th. Um, there's more information available at, on our website, saumc.life, or on our Facebook page. Our task force has been diligently working to outline a plan for the safe reopening of the church, and we are excited to announce that in-person worship services will begin on June 28th. So be on the lookout for more communication about our reopening plans in the next couple of weeks. 
In order to ensure that we can reopen in the safest manner possible while maintaining a welcoming environment for all that are in attendance, we're going to need a host of volunteers to perform a variety of tasks from setup to greeting to ushering and more. We'd love for you to join our team. <clears throat> so if you would just visit saumc.life, you can click on the join team button for more information and to also sign up. <clears throat> Please take a quick minute to fill out your online connect card so we know who's worshiping with us today. Remember, only one card needs to be completed per, fam per family. And finally, let's get back to our worship. Oh, 
restrained. Your love is wild. Your love is wild for me. It is in child. It's unashamed. Your love is proud to be seen with me. To be seen. Oh 
God, we come before you now reminded, God, of your unconditional love. I know so many of us right now, God, are just, are searching. We're trying to understand. We're trying to be the light. We're doing what we think is right. We're doing what you, what we feel that you have convicted us to do. What you have put on our hearts to do. But God, we are also human. We can do our best to love others. But we cannot do it without you, God. Help us to see others through your eyes. Help us to love others with your love. Not on our own, not ours. God, none of us are perfect. None of us are capable of loving unconditionally like you love us. But we're trying. We're doing our best. I pray, God, that as we move forward in the times that we're in right now, God, that we will seek you first and your purposes and your calling on our lives and help our soul focus, God, to be loving others like you love them, like you love us. God, you have given us your whole heart not in pieces, but every bit of it. And as we try to, to make our way through this crazy world that we're living in right now, God, help us to try to love with that same love, God, with the grace and mercy that is new to us each and every day that we don't deserve. God, none of us deserve it. But yet, you love us anyways. And you're there to pick us up when we fall down and we, when we mess up. And you offer us this grace, God, that we don't deserve, that, that is just never ending. As we seek to do your will, God, in this world, help us to, to give that grace to other people, God, to share your love with other people that may not even deserve it, God. But we are all your children all of us. You love each of us. You've created each of us in your image. And as we're trying to maneuver through this society that we're in right now, God, give us the courage to give us the strength to move ourselves in our pride, in our thinking, in our convictions out of the way and just do what you have given us, what you've put on our hearts. God, may we love with a fierce love like you love us. May we offer grace with a fierce grace, God. Because all of us, all of us, every person here on this earth deserves your love and your grace and help us to be the ones to share that with them. Thank you, God, that you are still on your throne, that you are still God, that you are still in control, that you have already overcome this world, you have conquered it, and help us to find our hope and our peace and our strength in you, God. We love you, we worship you. When we don't have the words to say, God, you know our hearts and we thank you for that. It's in your holy name that we pray, amen. It is really good to see all of you in worship this morning. Now, obviously, I can't see you, but I long for the day when that will be true. 
that we will be able to see one another. We don't know when that will be, but uh, we hope it's going to be soon. And that means this uh, crazy bug that's, that's been hounding us now for so long that it will be resolved. God will have moved it away from us and we will be made well again. So we look forward to those times. But in the meantime, we are grateful that we can be together like this and share in our hearts as we look to God for a word. And so we look to his word. Uh, if you have your Bibles and you know every week, I encourage you to, to do this, but, but get your Bibles and turn to Micah. Now that's one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. So if you would turn to Micah, we will read from the sixth chapter, starting at verse six. Listen, if you will, to the word of God. Micah is asking, With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with entirely burned offerings, with year-old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime? the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires from you. Listen carefully. To do justice. Embrace faithful love and walk humbly with your God. Bow with me, please. Father God, we have come to read your word. We have come to listen to your word. Enable this one who, who dares to speak on your behalf, to speak the truth for you. Please allow your Holy Spirit to work within each of our hearts and minds so that we might all of us hear the word, the message that you have for our hearts this day. As always, Father, we wait in your presence. Holy Spirit, we wait for your help. And dear Jesus, we trust you as always to be with us for encouragement and strength. So Father, we come to you now. We come to all of you in this time of worship together. Amen. Micah. This minor prophet is uh, doing some pondering, as it were. I don't know if he's reflecting on something. I don't know if he's talking to himself here. But he's raising questions about how in the world do I go before God? Now remember, that was a whole different era. It's different today for us. But for Micah, it was one of those very serious questions. How do I go before God and what will I bring to God? What would he expect me to bring to him? And then while he is pondering, it's as though God gives him that word. God reminds him of what he is expecting. And in the verse 6, verse 6, this is what Micah is asking of God. With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Well, then in verse 8, Micah gives us the answer that he gets from God. What, golly, what God really wants from all of humanity, you remember the wording here we just read, has to do with man, and here we understand that's mankind, if you prefer humankind, but it has to do with all people. In verse 8, he is saying to all of humanity, this, this is what will please me. Do justice. Don't just talk about it. Don't just think about it. Don't just cluck your tongue when it isn't happening, but rather take responsibility and do justice. And then embrace faithful love. Embrace mercy, if you will, as the King James Version would use that word, mercy. Again, be active, be proactive in this. Don't just sit back and watch, but be involved. And in the midst of all of this, 
he continues to Micah, and thus Micah to us. Walk humbly, walk humbly with God. Now, I read these words, and, and for a moment I kind of wrestled with this. I wondered, okay, is this message just for an individual? Is this just for me? Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. And of course, I have to understand, yes, it is directed to me, but isn't it also directed to all of the rest of us? Isn't it directed to the church? The church, that is an institution, but also the church, the made up of you and me, we make up the church. Now those that I have, I have had conversation with over the years, and Anna and I have been blessed to be back at St. Andrews now for over 20 years. Many of you have come into this church family after or during the time that we've been retired here. I have had conversations with many of you, especially around the breakfast table on Friday mornings. And all of you men, when we get our kitchen back, we encourage you to come out and be at the men's prayer breakfast. We have some good conversations. All of those Sunday school classes, all of you who have had discussions with me, you know that I have been concerned about the future of the church, the body of Christ, or as Paul says, the bride of Christ, the church universal, but also then all of the denominations that carry the name Christian, whatever that label might be. But specifically, I guess, the United Methodist Church. We're more closely at this point in our lives related to the United Methodist Church. But more specifically, the St. Andrews United Methodist Church. What does the future look like for us? And I'm saying to you today that the prophet Micah is speaking to us. This word from God is for us, the church. It is a wonderful thing that millions and millions of people around the world are serving God faithfully. They are following Jesus. That's not an overstatement. And we praise God for that. They are in ministry for God. But it's also true that millions, more millions, could care less. They are not at all interested in the church. And unfortunately, even in the United States, there are those who attack the church as though it's an enemy of society. Now, some of our brothers and sisters around the world are actually giving their lives because they are involved in the church. The church is of God. When Jesus and his disciples were at Caesarea Philippi, and you remember that incident where Jesus said to them, who do men say that I am? Who do others say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Well, in the midst of that conversation, Jesus says to them, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Now, he did not mention apathy at that point. Was this a part of his thinking? Because it seems to me that, that this may well be the biggest enemy of the church today. It's that I don't care one way or the other attitude. That shrugged the shoulders. I really don't care. I hope today's message concludes with uplifting you, but we have to look at where we really are today to be honest with ourselves. If the church is the people of God, and it is, then Micah has a, has a message for us. It's to do justice. It's to love kindness. It's to walk humbly with God. And yes, he's talking to the Hebrew nation here, but isn't what he's saying at the very heart of the Christian faith? Right in the middle of Christianity and all that it stands for? It has to do with loving each other and loving God. This thing of doing justice, loving mercy, walking humbly with God. You see, loving Jesus brings out the best in us, not the worst. Jesus is the ultimate example of what Micah is talking about here. Jesus illustrates for us. He, he, 
He shows us all how to do what Micah is talking about. What does it take to please God? But are we paying attention? Jesus demands change. Change in the individual, change in the temple, and by extension, change in the church. To illustrate, the rich young man came to Jesus. What must I do to be saved? Jesus said, hey, nothing to it. Just sell everything you've got and give it away. That's the power version. But the young man couldn't handle that. And the Bible says he turned and went sorrowfully away. But the interesting, interesting thing about this is Jesus didn't call him back. He didn't call him back and say, I was only teasing. Really just sell half of what you want and give the rest of it away. What Jesus wanted to happen in this man's life was to change. And the young man wasn't willing to do it. But then in the same New Testament, Jesus blasted the temple leaders, their authorities, for making his father's house a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer. He never retracted that judgment. He never went back to them and said, I really didn't mean it. Why? Because he expected them to change. In the book of Revelation, that book that you like to avoid, and I admit it, but I encourage you to read it. God will tell you from it what he wants you to hear. And there's certainly the, the letters to the seven churches, from chapter 2 and chapter 3. I not only encourage you, I really want you after the service today to read those chapters. But, but the book of Revelation repeatedly charges the church to change your hearts and lives. Does that sound familiar? I know you hear it often, but that is really where we are. We need to change. If we want society to change, we need to change. Read those seven of the letters to the seven churches. Jesus here was he was complimentary of most of these. You read the letters. I won't go into those. But he was especially harsh with the church at Laodicea. And why? Because they were lukewarm. Is that the same thing as apathy? They were lukewarm. He said, because you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Jesus expected change. Doing justice loving kindness and walking with God may require a change in our heart and in our mind. I say may because I know that many of us have made that decision to change our lives to be more like Jesus, to really work at being the person God would have us to be. Most of us have been there. We have been doing this. And there is a precedent for this, biblically speaking. We have recently talked about David. David desired a clean heart and a new spirit. Why? Because he needed a change. And he knew it. And he got it. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And we have used that phrase in the church all of these 2,000 years now. Why? Be born again. What does that mean? Change. Change, be a new person in Christ. Paul wrote of himself, and hopefully for you and for me, when he said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. When his name was changed from Saul to Paul, he became a new person. When did that happen for you? I don't mean your experience like Paul had. We have said so many times now, we are unique in how we have come to God. We don't do it all the same way, but at some point in our lives, that light bulb comes on up here and we say, ah, yeah. And we give ourselves to God. We surrender. We become his child. And we know that we belong to him. 
You don't need a date and a time, but you do need to know right now that it's for real in your life. But as a pastor, having stood for many years in a pulpit, having stood behind a good many pulpits, as a pastor, I wonder, how is it that religious practices week after week even participating in Holy Communion, how is it that that can leave a person ultimately unchanged? Now, don't be harsh with me because I'm saying the truth to you. This leads to more pondering. Is one's faith a personal thing with God? Or is it something we inherit from someone else and it's passed on from generation to generation? It's true that most of us were influenced by other folks, Christian folk, people who helped us as we, as we made our decision about Christ, but we all made that decision ourselves. It was a personal thing for us. At a seminar on evangelism once years ago, it was, the, the leader asked us by a show of hands, how many of you came to Christ under the influence of a friend or a family member, and just about every hand went up. We need to remember the power of our influence. All of those who were influential there, they were active in their church. Now, for me and my experience, yes, I knew uh, Reverend E.C. Abernathy, Brother Abernathy as we called him back then, He helped to tie the knot for Ina and me. So yes, I knew my pastor, but it was my Sunday school teacher who had the greater influence on my life. You are the church, and your every word and your every action carries weight. In his old age, and it was true old age for Billy Graham, he was being interviewed by Barbara Walters And in that interview, he was pondering, and he was pondering as to whether or not God had used him to bring good into the world. And I I heard that, and and it really saddened me to hear it. And then I, I wondered if God couldn't use what Billy Graham was doing. The rest of us are just treading water. We are influential, all of us. None of us are like Billy Graham and don't need to be. But we are God's children, and we're called for a purpose. But this kind of pondering of Billy Graham, that wasn't, that wasn't a new thing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German Lutheran pastor, imprisoned by the Nazis in Germany because he and some others tried to assassinate Hitler. And Bonhoeffer was hanged in 1944. He's written a, number, written a number of books from prison, and, and we've enjoyed those books. But in one of those, you find these words. What is bothering me incessantly is the question of what Christianity really is for us today. End of quote. Remember his context. Christians were killing Christians. And that ought not to be. It makes no sense. If he had lived, Bonhoeffer might have concluded that church was not doing justice. That the church was not loving kindness. And the church was not walking humbly with God. Now, there are some in some other places, none that live around close to us, I'm sure, but but I have spoken to some of these, and and some of them have a little bit of righteousness, self-righteousness there, a little indignation, and they ask, why isn't the church doing something? And I say to them, and I say to you, institutions make pronouncements. They establish the rules, but individuals take action. You and I take action. You see, it is so easy for us to outsource our personal responsibility. 
So what about the church? Is it even needed? Many, many seem to think so. Between the year 2000 and 2017, the United Methodist Church lost 17% of its members and 10% of its churches. And this was true across Christendom. All other mainline churches, it was the same. Yes, God is blessing us with what we're calling mega churches. We have churches across this country that are growing and doing wonderfully well. And yet, statistically speaking, the church is dying. Why? We like to use the word today, it's complicated. And it is. If there was an easy answer, we would have resolved it a long time ago. Some of it, some of the answer has to do with the way the demographics change around a local church, and the local, the local church has trouble with that. But a large part of it has to do with the attitude of society toward the church. And some of it, I believe anyway, has to do with what I'm calling homemade theology. People who have created their own theology without any reference to support, without anything to, except this is what they want to believe, and that's okay. But that means they decide they don't need the church. But it's also true that many members, many members who, who stand before the altar of God and take promises about who they are before Him and His, His church and all that, so many of these decide they don't lead the church anymore, and they vote with their feet, and how wrong they are. Again, statistically, the church is dying in the northern hemisphere, but it's growing in the southern hemisphere. And this is not breaking news. We all know this. Is it because the developing countries know they need God? And maybe it's because the Northern Hemisphere churches don't think they need God. Jesus said to the Laodiceans, You say, I'm rich, and I've grown wealthy, and I don't need a thing. But not only do we need God, we need the church, because the church is of God. And the church as an institution we have a campus. We have facilities. It's an institution, if you will. And the church as an institution is where we meet God in worship. It's what we're doing today. And I would to God that you were here with us in the sanctuary. But we encourage one another from here. We leave from here to go out and to serve God by doing what? Doing justice. Loving mercy and walking humbly with God. We must not forget it's the church that propagated the gospel. It's the church that preserved the Bible for you and for me. We would not be here today if the church as an institution had not existed. Now it may be said that the church exists to show Jesus to the world, not just talk about it. And that's the way it should be. Excuse me, that's the way it should be, to show Jesus to the world. The church exists to help all of us to grow in our faith, but we also are to make disciples. And we have to evaluate, how are we doing with that? For decades now, I resisted this early on, but for decades now, we have been called a post-Christian nation. Does this also mean that we are a post-church nation? A large portion of society have so personalized their faith, they've spiritualized their faith to the point that they're convinced they no longer need the church. And it's true, the church as an institution has very little influence in society, but the church, as individuals, wields great influence. The guidance of the church is no longer sought by those in power. In my over 50 years now, I've had only one politician call and ask me what the church's position was on something. In most casual conversations, apart from being at church, Americans seldom include the church. 
and society, generally speaking, seems to have a lukewarm or apathetic attitude toward the church. Micah is insisting that religion without the heart is unacceptable. And the whole Bible is clear that God wants our heart first. This is the message of Micah. God wants your heart and my heart. Jesus was concerned about religion without the heart. This is what leads to hypocrisy. And some of the harshest words Jesus used as he did his ministry was against the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. Jesus castigated the religious leaders for caring more about the trappings of religion than they cared about people. He minced no words. He was not politically correct. We may not always have been successful, but the church has always taught from the pulpit and from its classroom that what one really believes, not what we say, but what we really believe, that's going to be seen in the way we live our lives. Our scripture from Micah puts relationships before religion. What Micah is telling us is what the Lord requires of us. God has taken the initiative to make this happen. We call this prevenient grace. He then took the steps to save his people through Jesus on the cross, and we call this justifying grace. And then he sent his Holy Spirit to help us to grow in our faith, and we call this sanctifying grace. And when all of this grace is inherent in who we are and in the church, then there will be justice, then there will be kindness and a closer walk with God, and the church will be strong. My church history professor at Candler School of Theology became a, became a bishop, Dean Cannon, we called him, and he, he wrote this somewhere. I found it recently, and, and I thought it was a good statement. And I quote, it is the nature of the Christian religion to expand. It's the nature, I mean, it's expected to expand. And the propagation of the faith is synonymous with the gospel itself. And this is who we are. This is the work of the church. This is what we are about. The church has preserved this gospel message through trying times. You read church history and you'll understand. I have been known to say with a little bit of tongue in cheek, if God wasn't in the church, we would have killed it a long time ago. But God is in the church. It is his church. And it will be preserved until the end of time. But in what form? Personally, and I think you would agree with me, I don't want to live in a community without the church. Society has neglected the teaching of the church and will continue to do so until we regain our voices. The church is to change society, not the other way around. And all of this is not to preserve some institution with a title but it's about bringing people to Christ and the emphasis on justice and kindness is directly related to how we are relating to each other and how we are relating to God. Now is the time for unity. Now is the time for unity, not pointing fingers and not hostility. It is time to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. It's who we are, and it's what we do. Dear God, would you add your blessing to these words? May they be profitable for the work of the kingdom. Take what is unimportant away, but place within our own hearts what you want us to leave today with not literally leaving our homes where we might be, but leaving this, this time of, of virtual worship together. May we leave it with confidence that you're walking with us and give us the strength and the power, O oh God, to do justice.
to love mercy and to walk humbly with you. In the name of your precious Son, we pray. Amen. Thank you for your continuous giving. If you feel led to give this morning, there's a giving link in the chat screen. Or you can mail a check to St. Andrews. We are um, grateful for your faithfulness and for your um, generosity as we continue to reach people in our community, in our church. Um, so we thank you for your consistent giving. It, it definitely helps us to reach into the community and show the love of Jesus to people around us. We thank you for your unwavering faith, for your willingness to lead people to know God and experience his grace through our growing relationship with Jesus Christ.
Jesus, the keeper of peace, and peace is a promise he keeps. Yeah. 